Thanks for joining us. Um, if you just joined, we're just waiting a few minutes to let other folks join the call as well. For those just joining us, we're just waiting a few minutes to um, allow time for everyone to join and then we'll get started. Thanks for being here. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining tonight. Um, good evening and welcome to all of our fellow community members and partner organizations. Before we get started breaking down the city budget, we have some instructions for interpretation as we have a Spanish option for tonight's event. So uh, my colleague Ana Laura is gonna share instructions. Buenas noches y bienvenidos a nuestra comunidad que nos acompañan hoy. Antes de comenzar la plática sobre el presupuesto de la ciudad, vamos a repasar las instrucciones de interpretación en español. En la pantalla tenemos instrucciones. Como ve, tiene que ir abajo en la pantalla del Zoom y hacerle clic en los tres puntitos que dice More o Más. Al presionar eso, luego tiene que hacerle clic en lo que dice Language Interpretation o Interpretación de Idioma. Y luego seleccionar Spanish, Español. Si tiene preguntas, por favor, pónganlas en el chat. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos hoy. Thank you, Ana Laura. Um, I'll just let a few minutes to let people um, figure out the interpretation. And um, you know, let us know if you have any questions on that.
Okay, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining. Tonight, we are excited to work together to understand the city budget process, why it is so important, and how you can get involved to advocate for your community's needs. We're going to start by introducing our team. So my name is Chiara Pina. I am a researcher and policy advocate with the Center on Policy Initiatives and the Community Budget Alliance. I'll introduce my colleague, jean Wee. Hi, everyone. My name is jean Wee. I'm the organizer for the CBA and um, also with the CBI uh, team. And I'll pass it on to Anwar. Hi everyone, my name is Ana Laura, she and her ella, Center on Policy Initiatives as well, Organizer and Leadership Development Coordinator, and passing it to Jessica. Hi, my name is Jessica, uh, she, her, ella, and I am the Communications Manager at CPI. So the CPA is a coalition of over 20 organizations. Here is the full list of all of our partners. We work every day to stand up for our communities by making sure the city spends the money it has to increase the community well, health, and to bring justice to all communities. That means spending more money in places with more need or that have been historically excluded and less money in the places that already have access to more programs, services, and opportunities. We believe that the city budget should reflect the community need address in inequity and must sim simultaneously provide vital services and program that ensure a high quality of life for all our communities. We believe that by redefining public safety, improving environmental health, increasing housing access, securing workers' rights, and ensuring equitable access to services. San Diego can become a city that works better for everyone. Our city should be transparent about how it spends public dollars, and the community should have a say in the distribution of these resources, which belong to us all. To do this, the Community Budget Align organization work on the budget advocacy, budget education, and community engagement efforts all year round. Year round. We engage in budget advocacy by beginning each year by deciding what we want to ask for in the budget. These are our budget priorities. In creating these priorities, the partner organization work with folks in the community, either root meetings or in daily interaction to learn about issues that they are facing in their communities. We then communicate with council member in public meetings, like city council meetings where they discuss the budgets and in office visit with the mayor, council members, or other city staff to advocate for these priorities. We also provide budget education. We provide political education for community members to learn about the budgets, like we are doing right now, how money is collected, spent, and how decisions are made. Finally, we do community engagement work. The budget affects the daily life of every resident in San Diego. We hope that by providing opportunity to get involved, we can encourage people to, to engage in whatever ways they can, whether that be through following issues on social media, sharing new issues that arise in the community to inform our advocacy work, signing petition, calling, emailing their council members, speaking at public events, or volunteer with, with our, one of our partner organizations. Thanks, Sean Wee. Um, so now that we know a little bit more about the CBA, today we are going to break down the city budget process. So we're going to learn how big the city budget is, what's included in the budget, how budget decisions are made, and how you can advocate for your priorities um, and your needs in your community. So as we go through tonight's events, please feel free to ask any questions you have in the Q&A box and someone from our team will answer them as we go, or I will answer them um, throughout the presentation. So first, um, let's begin by kind of figuring out where we're starting as far as, as far as knowledge of the budget. So we're gonna put up a poll here in the webinar 
um, so that you can select the answer that best fits you. So the question is, on a scale of one to five, how well do you understand the city budget process? A one would be, I'm unaware of the process and I'm not sure how it works. A five would be, I know how to navigate the budget process and advocate for my community. So um, we'll leave a little time for that and um, looking forward to seeing everyone's answers. Hold on, we're having a little bit of issues with the poll. Um, so just a second. There we go. We'll give it a little bit more. Awesome. Okay, so it looks like most people are kind of starting at square one. We have a few um, really knowledgeable people in the room, um, but that's good to see. Hopefully by the end of this event, everyone will be more towards uh, the five end of that scale. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so let's get into it. Um, so what is a city budget and why is it so important? So Every service or community program that the city provides has a dollar amount attached to it, which is why it is important San Diego residents can engage in the process to ensure that services and programs that are important to them are reflected in the budget. Every program the city runs or service it provides has to be included in the budget. So by looking at what items are in the budget, we can easily see what is most important to our government officials. And because of this, the CBA considers the city budget as a sort of moral document that reflects what city government officials have decided is important. So what is included in the budget? Uh, there are things that the city is responsible for that are different from state or federal funding responsibilities. So the city is responsible for city services such as police, fire and parks, as well as planning, community development, and administrative support services. Think things like libraries, parks, and infrastructure, such as roads, sewers, sidewalks, street lights. And then these services and programs are localized to San Diego and specifically designed to serve San Diego communities. Some of the things not included in the city's responsibility are state or federal programs that run in cities and counties across the country. These are things such as, or the country or the county. Um, these are things such as public health services, mental health services, programs like foster care and administration of county jails and juvenile hall. These are issues that aren't necessarily unique to each city 
and serve more people beyond just the residents of San Diego. So we're gonna do another poll and I wanna invite you to share the amount, the dollar amount that you think the city has each year to spend. There's gonna be a few options and I just want everyone to take a guess on how big you think the city budget is. And I'll give you a few minutes to do that. We have options on, on the smaller side, um, around 100 million, less than 100 million, up to um, 4 billion or more. Um, so just take a wild guess on what you think the city has to spend each year. And I have a question in the chat if the, or I have a question if the slides will be shared afterwards. And um, yes, we'll be sharing them to our website um, after the event. So um, let's see, we got a lot of different answers here. Um, I think the most people um, think it's around two to $3 billion, um, kind of all over the board here. So thanks for, for answering that. Um, so actually, the people that guessed 4 billion are correct. Um, the city budget is approximately $4 billion. And it is split into six different funds. And the funds are separate. Um, so some money gets set aside for specific purposes or projects. The largest fund is the general fund, which holds about 40% of the total budget, which is about $1.6 billion. And the CBA focuses our advocacy on the general fund because it is the largest and most flexible funding stream. The other funds have um, more requirements around what the money has to be spent on. For example, the capital improvements program um, and capital projects funds have to be spent on infrastructure projects like roads and bridges and buildings. Um, but the general fund doesn't really have these restrictions. Um, so more can be done as far as creating new programs, expanding services, um, creating new jobs, and, and those sort of things. So the city obviously has a decent amount of money to work with, even if we are just looking at the general fund, that's $1.6 billion. Um, so we want to find out where would you like to see that money going? What would you prioritize spending money on if you were the mayor or a city council member? Um, so we're going to take a bit of time to identify what issues we would like to be addressed in a sort of people's budget. So we have an activity here. Um, so if you go to www.menti.com and use the code 1978463, and this information is up on the screen, and we're also sharing it in the chat, you can use your computer or a phone and on that site, we'll have a few kind of interactive questions. So I will give you a little bit of time to get there um, while I switch to that activity as well. So I see some folks are already in there. Um, so once you get there and put in that code, you'll have um, a question and it's, what do you think is the biggest need in your community? And there's a box where you can write in up to three words or phrases and you can actually do that process multiple times if you would like, if you want to add more words and just write in anything that comes to mind. What do you think, you know, the city should be spending most of its money on? Are there things that you think your community needs um, that maybe aren't being addressed or maybe they are being addressed, but you just think they're really important? Um, please feel free to share them in there and kind of the answers will populate as you can see um, as we as they come in. Um, so we see a lot of affordable housing, housing, affordable housing, addressing homelessness. Those are kind of 
the most popular answers right now. Um, the biggest words are kind of the most populated. So other things I see like rent control, health services, mental health services, education, um, defunding the police. We have a lot of people on this call, so we're gonna get a lot of words populated in here. Um, immigration, uh, canceling rent, unemployment, affordable housing is like a really big one here. Um, so I can see, I mean, based on these responses, it seems like a lot of folks in this call have um, a lot of similar hopes um, for what the city will spend its money on. Um, I see a lot of kind of what I would consider basic human needs like housing, health care, um, mental health care, education. Awesome. I'll give just a few more minutes so everyone can kind of put in their two cents. Parks, food, it's a good one. Um, police brutality, defunding the police, racial justice. Awesome. We already have 220 responses, that's great. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next one. It's really awesome to see everyone's priorities and kind of how we come together as a group to identify what's most important to us. Um, so we're gonna do something similar with the next question. Um, there's one more question on here. So this question is, um, please rank your priorities for San Diego's budget. So the city budget is split into different categories, which we will get into after this activity, um, but I kind of want to see um, what y'all's thoughts are first. Um, and so we have some of those categories here. I know there's kind of a lot to choose from, but you're basically going to, you'll be prompted to rank which ones are your first, second, third, fourth, fifth priority. And this is, you know, not necessarily a value statement. I know sometimes it's difficult to, you know, choose between a lot of things that might be necessary in your community, but it's just like your gut instinct on what you think is most needed in your community. Um, and so some of the options are worker protections, workplace safety, good jobs, housing and tenants rights and homelessness assistance, environmental justice, climate change and sustainability, public transit, infrastructure, youth services, police and fire rescue. Um, and so as, as the answers come in, I know it might take a little bit to rank all of them, but as the answers come in, we'll kind of see which one is the most uh, prioritized or what, what the majority of the participants are prioritizing here. So I'll give everyone a few minutes. So housing, I mean, similar to the first activity, that one seems to be edging out as a front runner here. Environmental justice is big. Worker protections are big. I can't help but notice that police is the very last priority. Oh, community services, just edging out public transportation. Those two are close. Mm. 
I'm gonna give a little bit longer just to let people, everyone kind of submit their priorities. Thanks again, everyone for joining. We have 139 participants. So, um, you know, it's really great that everyone took the time tonight to kind of learn about the budget and, and how you can get involved. Okay, it looks like the answers are slowing down a bit. Um, hopefully everyone was able to, to get into this activity. Um, so it looks like housing tenants rights and homelessness assistance, that is our kind of big winner here, um, followed by environmental justice, uh, climate change and sustainability, workers protections, um, and all the way down at the bottom, we got the police. Um, so now that we know what you would like the city to spend its money on and have identified the issues that you care about here, um, I want to show you what the city has prioritized historically and kind of what their rankings are as far as how much money um, they're putting towards each of these categories. So last year, one in every three city dollars was spent on police. This is almost, oh, sorry, I need to change the screen. Sorry about that. There you go. Last year, one in every three city dollars was spent on police. This graph looks a little bit or a lot a bit different um, than what everyone ranked as their priorities. Um, things that people put in like housing and tenants rights support, um, you know, a lot of programs and services is all bunched into this like program expenditures um, category or the other category. Um, you know, things like library, very small, that's like the community services, parks and libraries. So we can see that this is very different um, than what everyone shared. Um, and I think the big takeaway here is really that one of every three city dollars is spent on police. And other departments are just such a smaller percent of the total budget. So we know that the police budget is massive, um, but it's also grown over the past 10 years. So this graph may seem like a lot, but if you look at the red line that increases as you go across. Um, that's the police budget growth over 10 years. So you can see that the budget has grown from around 400 million in 2012 to over 550 million in 2021. And that's a really big chunk of change. And while the police budget has grown this much, all other categories have remained relatively the same or even decreased in some years. And by this graph, we can see that the budget is not changing with changing community need. And it shows us that in numbers that elected officials continually prioritize police over other really vital city services and city services that our communities desperately need and would want to prioritize if they had a say in the budget. Things like housing and environmental justice and worker protections that you all uh, shared with us earlier. So does this breakdown match what you all identified as your priorities? Like I said, I would say no. Um, you all shared things like housing and parks, having less police in your communities. Um, and these true community needs have been severely underfunded by our elected officials while the police budget continues to grow. And that is why the CBA coalition came together to work on the budget, because we realized that so many of the priorities our communities share and need and desire are not reflected in the budget. And so working on changing the budget is so important in creating systemic change. So I'm gonna now bring on Jessica to introduce our coalition partners. And we're gonna talk more about some of our CBA priorities that we're advocating for in the budget and kind of what we do as a coalition.
Hi, um, each of our working groups, um, well, sorry, let me start again. <laughs> I'm gonna introduce a representative from each of our working groups to share a little bit about our priorities and the different issue areas we focus on. We focus on redefining public safety, secure housing for all, community-led government, and environmental justice and creating a true people's economy. So each of our working groups are gonna host a panel in the coming months where you can learn more about the specific demands of each group. As they're talking about what we're fighting for and if it's something that resonates with you or that you're passionate about, passionate about, they'll be going more in depth about the issues in each of their panel events. And they'll be also be talking about the root causes of some of these issues. Um, there's a Google form that we're gonna be sharing in the chat where you can sign up for the events to be kept informed of what's happening. So the first person that um, our working group is Ariana. Ariana um, is part of the Redefining Public Safety Working Group and she's gonna talk a little bit more about what they're doing. Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Ariana. My pronouns are she or hers. I am the lead organizer at Amid City Camp, um, but I do currently work with the Redefining Public Safety Working Group. So we have identified large amounts like how Kiara had explained that um, a lot of the budget is allocated to the police budget. Specifically, we have identified amounts of the string gang unit, the gang intervention unit and overtime that should be invested and reinvested into alternatives to policing. We know right now that the city is not prioritizing the care of our black indigenous and people of color. And our ask and really our demand is to really ensure that the city starts um, investing in community-based initiatives and divesting from the systems of policing and incarceration. So we will have, um, in March, we will have a two-part series that we'll, we will dive into on these specific issues, um, the budget funds, um, but also uplift the work of the budget priorities and policy priorities. So that does include first divesting from police and investing communities. While we also um, will talk about the community, um, community youth and young adult violence prevention programs, specifically for neighborhoods in San Diego that include City Heights, Barrio Logan, Memorial Park, Mount Hope, Ocean View, Lincoln Park, in Canto and Skylines. Many of the times these are neighborhoods that are being left out of the conversation and narrative of needs in our in our city. Also um, pushing for a transitional age unit um, that will have um, more of a restorative justice approach um, when, um, when supporting young people um, rather than pushing them to the school to prison pipeline. And then we are also um, supporting the advocacy around PROTECT, which is preventing over-policing through equitable um, community treatment. So really addressing policing practices that are invasive and um, overall like, very inappropriate um, when it comes to um, folks that have disabilities that identify as Black, Latinx, and the LGBTQ community. So we will continue to have more conversations and I hope that you're able to join us during our um, panels that where we will be talking specifically about the history of policing, the issue that we're seeing with the police budget and how we could really start talking about how to defund the police and reinvest and reimagine public safety. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and bring on Blake. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Blake Hopstead. I'm the organizer for Parent Voices, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, <clears throat> and I represent the Secure Housing for All working group. So it was really interesting um, seeing people's responses and how housing and homelessness services are such a priority for so many of you. Um, and yet in San Diego, we have historically underinvested or not invested at all um, in services for tenants. Um, for example, if you go on the 211 San Diego website and you search eviction, uh, prevention, legal assistance, you get nine results for the whole county. And if you do that same search in 211 Los Angeles, you, you literally get over a thousand results. 
So it doesn't have to be this way. Our city makes decisions year after year not to invest in tenant services, uh, not to protect tenants from evictions. Um, and so our working group right now is primarily focused in sort of two different ways. One is immediate relief. We know obviously that COVID has impacted tenants quite considerably. Um, folks are still being evicted from their homes. Folks are falling behind on their rent. Uh, so we're we're hoping that the city and the city will be investing more money into immediate rental relief. Um, but we'd also like to start building an infrastructure of tenant support and protections in San Diego. Um, we're, we're hoping that the city will invest into the community-based organizations that work with tenants every day, um, community organizations that are providing legal assistance and, and counseling so tenants know their rights um, and are able to stand up for their rights. Um, and finally, we're, we're looking for ways that the city can raise money um, to fund these services. So one example is uh, through a rent registry. Uh, a rent registry is a, is a tool that um, will allow the city to enforce the statewide rent cap that was passed last year, um, collect a lot of data. So if, uh, for example, a, a tenant is evicted from their homes, um, a landlord would have to report that to the rent registry and explain why. Uh, so we're not um, seeing illegal evictions happen. Um, and this would come with the with the fee. And so this way, we're, we know that we're generating money for the city to be able to spend to uh, protect our tenants. And the majority of people who live in San Diego are tenants. Uh, and we really have an obligation and a responsibility um, to, to protect those folks so that they don't become homeless. So uh, we'll be having a, a panel event on Tuesday, March 23rd, and the best way to, to keep, you know, to, to know about this stuff is definitely to follow the CBA um, on social media. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll introduce uh, Warson from the Democratizing Power Working Group. Um, thanks, Blake. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Watson. I am with Youth Will, a proud member of the Community Wage Alliance, and I am representing the Democratizing Working Group or the Community Led Government Group. Um, we um, are working towards a community led government because we believe, um, we, because a lot of times the most underrepresented um, underserved communities are left out of our city democracy. We believe that everyone deserves equitable access to um, city services, programs, opportunities, and so on and so forth. Um, we believe that everyone, um, in our working group, we're focusing on issues that pertain to communities that a lot of times left out, um, like left out of our city that are not represented and their voices are left out. Um, we are working on, for example, to increase language access because we believe that every resident, every single resident of our city deserves to have access to resources, programs, services, and opportunities in a language that they understand. That includes our immigrant families, including our undocumented residents, um, that they should be receiving um, services in their native language. Um, a lot of times when the city puts out, for example, housing assistance, um, small business assistance, those um, resources are in English, but the communities that need it the most um, cannot access it due to language access. That's why we're working towards increasing language access in our city government. Um, we are also working on um, opportunities for youth employment and the creation of an office of child and youth success because we believe that young people are not only the future, but they are the leaders of today and that they should be invested um, to reach their own, uh, their full potential. Uh, our youth and children are the backbone of our communities. Um, and in order to do that, we believe that the city should invest in our young people. Um, last but not least, we're also working on including community engagement in the creation and the shaping of the Office of Race and Equity, because there shouldn't be any um, offices or any services within the city of San Diego without our input and our voice. Um, there should be nothing that is done for us without us. Um, in, to conclude, in our group, we're working towards the opposite of what we saw earlier today. We're working towards a city where our community priorities match the city priorities. And as you have seen earlier, that is not the case right now. Um, and we're hoping to create that city the city that fits our priorities, that fits um, the community that we wanna see that prioritizes our homeless community, our um, like that prioritizes rental assistance, that 
prioritizing the services that we need rather than services rather than other things such as policing. Uh, we also have an event coming up for this working group on March 9th, Tuesday, March 9th, 5.37 p.m. So we're hoping to see you there. Thank you all so much for joining us today and I hope you enjoy your event. And on that note, I'm gonna pass it to Les to um, pursue on environmental justice. Excellent, thanks so much for your son. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Les Duncan. I'm the Senior Director of Programs at Outdoor Outreach, a nonprofit that works to connect youth to the transformative power of the outdoors. And today I'm representing the Environmental Justice Working Group of the Community Budget Alliance. Environmental justice is a body of work um, that really ensures that all people, regardless of race, income level, national origin, have the opportunity to live in healthy communities free of pollution and environmental hazards. Um, and have access to green spaces um, and outdoor spaces such as parks and beaches. Um, I'm super excited to see that the community uh, really elevated that environmental justice is one of the issues that you're most passionate about. And so, and, and that's mainly because local land use uh, decisions, decisions on energy, transit, climate action um, have very real and very direct impacts on residents of San Diego, especially in lower income communities and communities of color, um, making the city's commitment to environmental justice critical, and especially at this time. So we believe that San Diego has the opportunity to really lead, uh, to lead in local clean energy that uh, really helps the climate uh, to improve. Um, we believe that our city can lead in public transportation, making sure that everyone has accessible uh, or everyone has access to public transit um, to get to and from work and social life. And also we believe that our city can uh, really lead in making sure that we have safe parks in every community um, and green spaces that support the health and the mental health of our community. So that's why our working group is working to a, ensure that the, MP, that the MTS really prioritizes transit riders by not cutting bus routes. We're working to advance park development, especially in low-income communities and communities of color, such as you know, beginning a community-led design process for Emerald Hills Park, um, something that has already been approved, funding that has already been approved, but that the city hasn't yet taken action on, or creating capital improvement projects uh, for the Boston Avenue Linear Park um, or along the Choice Creek uh, watershed, for example. We're also encouraging the city to certify uh, the updated climate plan, which really includes uh, creating local green jobs um, and increasing access to low cost and efficient transit and secure and clean energy provisions. We believe that by taking these steps as, uh, along with others um, and our policy priorities, will not only create a cleaner San Diego, um, but also a, a San Diego where people can be healthy and where, where people can thrive. And with that, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Ana Laura, uh, to share next. Thanks, Les. We're actually going to um, invite Sherry, uh, last minute switch, but please, Sherry, um, tell us about uh, the people's economy and worker justice. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Good evening, everyone. I am Reverend Sherry Mateer, co-founder and executive director of Interfaith Worker Justice of San Diego County. And we bring together workers, faith leaders, and faith communities to advocate for workers' rights, living wage, safe working conditions. And that's why Interfaith Worker Just San Diego is part of the Community Budget Alliance. And I just wanna kind of lift up real quick that um, my, you know, my faith and the faith tradition of many believe in a creator that created everything, including all humanity, which it, it are our workers. And my personal tradition, Christianity teaches that God created you know, everything and said, it is good. It is very good. And that, and because of that, you know, all workers deserve what is good and very good because we are created in and as God's image. Um, and that, that is one of the reasons that the workers justice movement for, for decades has been 
pushing not only that each and every worker have their daily bread, but roses too. That workers deserve better than just enough, but in abundance as God gives to all people. And all major religions have sacred texts that uplift workers and protect them. Our city budget is a moral document that should also protect workers. And so in the People's Economy or Worker Justice Group, we envision a city where all workers are valued and where institutions and government can be trusted to have workers' best interests at heart. And so we for, you know, want, to, want the city budget to reach out and support um, workers and, their, and the ability to promote the economy that works for everyone. Um, so some of the things that we are pushing for in our San Diego city budget is income replacement or direct cash aid to workers who are not included, have been intentionally excluded from state and federal benefits, especially during the adverse effects of the pandemic. And so um, another thing is uplifting small businesses, especially those in San Diego Promise Zone to have you know, special loans for them, a special um, small business relief fund. Um, and you know, local hires so that our you know workers, especially in good city jobs with benefits, don't have to live outside of the city um, without that. So they hire people within the city so they can um, they live work in their community where they live and their children go to school. We also are asking for just a redistribution of funds um, to align many city offices to create an office of labor standards and equity. And this would uplift the health and safety for all um, workers, enforce uh, labor laws more effectively and protect workers and citizens. So, so this would be easier to assess and enforce the minimum wage program, earn sick leave, the living wage program, um, labor compliance program and other such things. So again, remember, you know, when we're looking at this is that a budget is a moral document, it talks about where our values are, where our cities value, what our city values. And valuing workers is important to all of us and the health of the overall city economy. So I would like to invite each and every one of you to come to the People Economies panelist discussion on Tuesday, March 30th. And now I'm not sure who's next, so I'm gonna pass it on to whoever's next. Hi, um, I'm next. This is Jessica again, and I just wanted to go over the dates and there's a Google form in the chat. Um, so March 2nd, we'll be redefining public safety. We'll have two panels on redefining public safety. The first one is March 2nd. Um, on March 9th, we'll have a panel on democratizing power. On March 16th, we'll have a panel on environmental justice. On March 23rd, we'll have a panel on ten housing and tenants rights. On March 30th, we'll have a panel on the people's economy. And on April 6th, we'll have another panel on redefining public safety. All of the panels are at 530 to make it accessible for everybody to be able to join. Thanks, Jessica. Um, and we'll put these dates up at the end of the event as well. Um, just make sure everyone has them. So, and thank you to all of our partners um, for sharing. You know, we have multiple different, um, you know, like Jean, we said in the beginning, we have 25 different organizations that are part of the Community Budget Alliance. And each of those organizations has joined a working group. And that working group kind of works together in these different issue areas. Um, so they've been, you know, really hard at work. And, um, you know, we're all very passionate about this. So we hope to see you at our, our panelist events coming up. So now that we've talked about the budget um, and what we would like to see in it, I wanna share some perspective. And, you know, we propose a lot of new programs and you'll hear a lot about our priorities in our panel events, but um, we have a kind of laundry list of, of 
things that we would like to see um, prioritized in the city budget. And so much of that is based on, you know, things that you shared today, like housing and tenants rights, worker protections, environmental justice, increased park access, all of that stuff. So um, we list a lot of things, but to fund all of the CBA priorities we propose this year, it would actually only amount to 15% of the police budget. That's how big the budget is. And that is 100% doable. And so this difference in what the community needs versus what the city actually funds is why CBA partners are so passionate about our advocacy work and why we want you to join us in our work. And our coalition priorities this year span these categories that you all pointed out are most important. So we hope you join us in advocating for our communities this budget cycle by engaging with your representatives, joining us at budget hearings and events and following our work. So I wanna talk now about you know, how you can get involved and how budget decisions are really made so you can determine how to engage in the process. And so let's start with understanding who makes budget decisions, and then we can learn how we as community members can influence that process. So city budget decisions are made through a process that involves both the city council and the mayor's office. So the mayor is ultimately the one responsible for proposing the city budget. He oversees city staff in most every department to create the budget. And the city council can provide recommendations before the mayor proposes his budget and they can propose modifications to the mayor's proposed budget. Departmental staff also has some say in the budget process. They can propose budget priorities for their department. For example, um, you know, staff who work in parks and recreation can provide information to the mayor's office regarding how much money is needed to support their services and can request for additional funding and then Mayoral staff, such as the chief financial officer and chief operating officers, also have a say in creating the budget because then they can basically approve and deny those requests or, or you know, uplift them with the mayor's office. So in summary, the city council can propose suggestions and edits and can veto any mayoral decisions with a majority of votes. Um, but the mayor has the majority of responsibility of creating and finalizing the budget. And you, as a resident of the city, elected these officials. So it is your responsibility to hold them accountable to your community's needs. So the majority of city council members are actually in their first term, and most were elected in 2020. Um, Jola Cava, Stephen Whitburn, Marty Van Wilpert, Raul Campillo, and Sean Ila Rivera, they were all elected in 2020, and our mayor, Todd Gloria, was also elected in this past election. So we are curious to see who we have at this event, and we also want to be sure that you know who your city council member is so that you can advocate for your community's priorities. So I wanna do another poll, and this one is just an easy question. It's who is your city council member? So I have a map up here. You know, if you live on the border of one of these areas, it might not be super easy to figure out who your council member is, um, but hopefully you either know already or um, you can find out here. And then if you're not sure, um, that is okay. And hopefully we can, you know, find that out for you or you can find out and, um, you know, it, the knowledge is handy um, because your city council member is a resource for you to connect with to make sure your priorities are taken into account in the budget cycle. Council members are there to take community input. Um, they have assigned people and staff in their offices to receive calls from constituents and, and listen to community needs. So, um, you know, they're, they're prepared to hear from you. Um, and by knowing who your council member is, hopefully um, you can engage with them as well. So we'll give a little time for people to um, answer this question.
And we just shared in the chat too, um, you can uh, resource that you can put in your address and find out who your city council member is. So after this, if, if you didn't know here and want to figure that out, um, you can go there as well. So, okay, it looks like we got a lot of people from District 3 on this call. Um, some District 9, kind of all over the place. Um, we have at least one representative from every city council district um, on our event tonight. So that's pretty cool. Um, so you can, you know, keep this knowledge in mind um, so that you can, you know, reach out to your city council member in the future. Awesome. So besides knowing who your city council member is, it is also important to know how the process works and when the best time is to advocate for your priorities and influence decision making. So there's a lot on this slide, but I'm gonna go through it kind of step by step. So the city council's budget adoption process spans from January through June. And I'll start with where we are right now. So in February and March, by now the city council members have they each create a list of their priorities. Um, and then the priorities that were shared among five or more council members are then included in a budget resolution. And that was submitted to the mayor's office. So by now that has been submitted. And then now in March and April, the mayor reviews the council suggestions and includes his own priorities. And in April, the mayor will release his proposed budget. And so we'll be able to see kind of an initial look at what the mayor and the city council members have prioritized in their budget. In May and June, the city then hears public input in different budget hearings. And at these events, members of the public can join and share any changes or additions that they would like to see in their proposed budget. And the city council also has the opportunity to propose changes to the mayor's proposed budget. And one of the most important events here in May are the budget hearings. There's one on May 5th and one on May 17th at 6 p.m. And here, that's where the city council has a special meeting in the evening to hear public input. And it's just, you know, you are able to kind of call in and share um, your thoughts on the budget and us as a CBA, we normally, you know, review the budget, see what's in there, see what priorities we have that are reflected in the budget. And then we can use that, those events as a way to, another way to communicate with council members. And so our Google form that we shared earlier, and we'll share again in the chat, um, it has a spot for you to RSVP, and we'll send you more information when that's coming up um, to make sure that your voice can be heard at those events. So continuing with the process, um, the changes are made in May and June based on public input. And um, by June, that's when um, the final budget is adopted and finalized. So the mayor takes in all the public input and the city council changes, makes a final budget proposal and that goes to a vote um, and it's finalized by June 15th. And then once the adopted budget is passed, um, the process just starts over again for the next budget year. And I'll note too that the adopted budget goes through a monitoring process throughout the year to make sure actual spending matches what's budgeted. So sometimes there are other opportunities throughout the year um, for budget advocacy. So now that you know how the budget works, you know the timeline, you know who's involved in the decision making, we saw how large the budget is and kind of what the city spends its money on. I want to do go back to the first poll that we had at the beginning. Um, it's going to be the same question um, on a scale of one to five. How well do you understand the city of San Diego budget process? One would be I know little to nothing about the budget. And five is I know how the city budget works enough so I can advocate for my community. So we'll give a little bit of time for that.
Awesome. Okay, it looks like we improved. At the beginning, we had most people in the one or two spot, and now we have the majority of people um, in the three, four, and five. So that is great to see. Um, it looks like everyone's learned a lot. And, you know, I hope the most important thing that you take away from this is that you all are actually already a policy and budget expert because you know what your community needs best. I saw so many answers earlier and everyone was so quick to come up with priorities that they would like to see in the city budget. And so now you just have additional tools in your advocacy toolbox in order to make those needs a reality. So thank you everyone. I'm gonna now invite an Alora and we're gonna you know, take our advocacy and, and put it into action. Thank you, Kiara, so much for all that critical information you shared. This information equips us to better advocate for our communities and uplift the urgent needs that our communities face, as Kiara mentioned. Now that we have this better understanding of the budget and our advocacy and organizing toolboxes, a critical next step is to communicate those community priorities with Mayor Todd Gloria. The city council members have already shared their budget priorities and the mayor will soon be proposing his budget. It is our job that he hears from us on what the priorities are for impacted communities. We're not in a normal time period. We're in an unprecedented economic and health crisis. And we need to uplift the need for Mayor Gloria to be bold, to intentionally center equity, and come through for Black, POC, immigrant, housing insecure, essential workers, come through for those impacted by this crisis. Please click on the link in the chat that we're going to be posting or you can immediately send an email to the mayor and his financial staff who helped prepare the budget. Um, please share this link with your family and friends, your neighbors to help uplift the CBA priorities. You already saw that the budget is drastically very um, uh, one-sided, so we really need to change that. Um, we also, I wanna reshare the dates again for each of our panelists events. So we can go to the next slide. So just a reminder, at these events, you will be able to learn more about each working group's priorities, including the history of the problem, why our proposed solutions will help, and how you can take action with us to advocate for these priorities. We, we are going to redrop again the Google form to RSVP in the chat. If you are interested in these upcoming events, please sign up. We want to connect with you. I'm in the, working, I'm in the Worker Justice Working Group, and I want to connect with you. Um, let's see, next slide as well. Lastly, we want to just, just share that the two other important dates on this list are the budget hearings on May 5th and May 17th, as Kiara mentioned. The budget hearings are an opportunity for you and community members to voice what you agree and disagree with in the proposed budget. Here you will have a chance to call in and advocate with us to ensure community priorities and that equity is reflected in that final budget. We hope you will join us. We will also be sharing how the proposed budget aligns with the CBA priorities before those budget hearings. So please follow us. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook for updates on how you can take action through this budget cycle and stay informed on our future events. This is a moment to continue plugging into community and to build power with our families and neighbors and with each other because we all have a responsibility to each other and to challenge the systems that create inequities. Let's be bold together. Let's be fierce in our advocacy and organizing as we envision a different world that is possible. So on behalf of the entire Community Budget Alliance, we are deeply grateful for you sharing virtual space with us tonight and taking the time to learn about the city budget. We look forward to working together this budget cycle to make sure the budget reflects what our communities urgently need the most. So again, don't forget to click on the link that we shared and send Mayor Todd Gloria an email. Thank you and have a great rest of your night. Thanks everyone. Since we have a little bit more time for those who ask questions, I'll just, you know, take some time to answer some questions. Um, if, you know, while people are taking action um, and sending those emails, you can, you know, listen to me in the background. Um, so some questions, you know, there's some really good questions in the Q and A. Um, one of them is, it seems, it sometimes seems like by the time we get to May, the budget is pretty set and public advocacy at the council meetings is mostly lip service. 
Is there truth to that? Should we be contacting our council members now to let them know what we want to see? The answer to that is 100% yes. Um, contact your council members at any time throughout the budget cycle. Um, but especially now, like now is the best time because the proposed budget hasn't come out yet. So, you know, we have, you know, kind of kicked off our campaign as a CBA with this event on the budget 101. So now that you, now you have advocacy tools to contact your city council member and you're more knowledgeable about the budget process so that you can do just that. Um, we're also going to have actions coming up. So if you, you know, follow us on Instagram, we're going to have a lot of um, we do a lot of like calls in to city council meetings or city council committee meetings. Um, and, you know, you can also personally call your city council member. Um, we might have other opportunities and other events um, at our panelist events. There's going to be opportunities to um, take some direct actions um, similarly to this email. Um, and yeah, so but there is still time in May to raise your voice. So there, the proposed budget does come out and there are changes made through those public hearing process processes. So I wouldn't say that, you know, it's just a, um, just a process to go through, like changes do happen, um, but the earlier you can get engaged, you know, the more chances you have to kind of influence the process. Um, another question we have is there is there an actual schedule of different steps of the budget cycle on the city's budget on the city's website or something? Um, yes, there is. Um, I'm going to find that link and I'll link it into the slides. Um, and so when we share the slides after the event, um, that will be in there as well. Um, but I believe it's just under FY 22 budget timeline and there's a list of dates, um, but I'll find that. And um, are there opportunities to revise the budget throughout the year in extenuating circumstances such as a pandemic? How did COVID affect this year's budget? Um, jean we answered this in the Q&A um, and he is 100% correct. The budget that is passed in June is, is, is just a budget. It's just projected spending. So as the year goes on, there are quarterly reports and mid-year updates that the Department of Finance provides that, you know, basically show what actual spending is compared to what was budgeted. Um, and there are opportunities to kind of adjust as the year goes on. A lot changed, um, not necessarily in what was budgeted, but a lot more was able to be done um, through state and federal funding that came in um, through like COVID relief funding. Um, we're actually going to do a bit of analysis in the coming weeks about where the COVID funding went. Um, and so we will provide that on our social media. Um, so you can watch out for that um, for more information on exactly where the COVID relief funding went. Um, and another question kind of similar to before, what points in the budget process are most vital for input from community advocacy groups? Um, every part of the budget process, I know that's a little cop out answer, but um, really at any time that you can give your input is, is useful, but especially right now um, before the proposed budget comes out, like this is really the time to get loud about what you want to see in the budget. Um, Hopefully a lot of folks are, are starting that today um, with our direct action. Um, and then I will share our social media again, because that was a question um, so that you can get more information. We share information on our priorities um, so that you can learn more about, you know, we kind of break down the different policy aspects of our priorities um, and all of our, you know, direct calls to action and getting involved will be will be there. So um, I think that's all the questions we had in the chat that were answered. And again, we'll share the slides on the website. So thank you everyone for joining tonight. Um, and 
I am deeply thankful to everyone for joining and hopefully um, you'll get involved with us.